ministers tonight. Check, 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 check. There we go. That's enough for me. I, I didn't get to say it. That's enough for me. Let's give it up for Jesus in this place. Come on. Hey, come on. We can't stand for me and not stand for Jesus. Come on. Can we? There we go. Jesus is who we're here to see, who we're here to encounter. And uh, I'm just his servant. I'm just his messenger and, and uh, excited to be here with you tonight on, uh, what night is it tonight? What? Monday night. See, it's all, I'm all messed up. It's like, I don't, you don't usually experience this on a Monday night. Church gathering on a Monday. I'm like, what day is it? What an awesome church you guys have here, and what an awesome uh, senior pastors you have, and we just honor them and love them. Oh, come on, you got to, what a blessing. You know, it's, it's easy just to get the job done and move on, but these guys are like, let's have a revival night, let's stir revival in our city, let's... Let's go into Monday night and let's bring in speakers from all over and, and this is just the start. We're going to go from glory to glory to glory. So last night we had an incredible time. Worship always prepares the soil, right? Worship is, is what brings God's presence. Uh, you could be in a prison cell and if you start worshiping, the, the chains are going to fall off. And, and I love that story in the Bible about Paul and Silas because they didn't run out once God's presence showed up. God's presence is so good, you could be in the mis- middle of a place of misery and enjoy it, and then other people start encountering the same presence you're feeling, so it's so cool that you come to these on these nights of work and these nights of the week because the, you are the carriers of the presence of God. I am the carrier. We're the carriers of the presence of God, so when we worship and we steward that, we're going to go out in our city and see souls saved, see revival nights become revival days and revival mornings, Amen. Amen. So I just encourage you, as this thing goes, keep bringing more people. Let's have people get saved every night. Let's have our neighbors come to this. This could be the, the injection they needed on a Tuesday night, a Wednesday night, to see God move in their life in powerful ways. Amen? Amen. 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 Well, I'm excited. I, got, I do have a message for you here to preach. Uh, before I preach it, I, I wrote a book called Declare War on Fear. And how many of you guys know if we're going to conquer fear, we're going to have to declare war on it? Fear is not an emotion uh, alone, it's a spirit that attacks your emotions to destroy your mind and ultimately rob your call and to kill, steal, and destroy from your life. And uh, I've just found fear will take more than you let it. And uh, if you leave it in one section of your house, it will start evading every section of your house. And not just your house, your kids' house and their kids' house. It's generational. It attacks onto families and never stops. And so I've just decided in my life, I'm not just conquering uh, my Goliath. I'm going to fight my dad's Goliath. Because really, Goliath wasn't David's battle. It was Saul's battle. But David chose to fight a battle that wasn't his so he can set free a kingdom of people. And so I believe there's some people here that are going to take on the Goliath of fear and say, you're not going to rob from my family. You're not going to rob from my kids. And so I want to give out this book today. Who needs this book? Oh, right, there. right there, bro. You got, you, and you got the sweet shirt on, too. Come on, give it up. What, what's your name? Larry. Larry. Give it up for Larry with, right here on the front row. This, this is the church of the hairpiece and the mohawk. Those, those, those riding skateboards and those that came in on walkers. Come on, those of us dyeing our hair to look cool and those that are dyeing our hair to look normal. Hey man, praise God for all of us here. We are the church of Jesus Christ. Come on, do we have that church in the house? Hey man, well let's pray. And I got a word for you tonight. And the word tonight is called the seventh hour. Seventh hour. I believe this is the seventh hour we're prophesying tonight. This is not just a a message. It's going to be a prophetic word tonight, okay? Jesus, we thank you for tonight. We thank you for this amazing conference. And we thank you that your word does not return void. That it does what you sent it to do. And Lord, that this word that you have for tonight, you sent it for such a time as this 
to do something in our hearts tonight in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. 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 John, if you have your Bibles, we're going to turn to John chapter 4, verse number 46. I'm going to read this. And and again, I know this is a holler back church, so don't be afraid to holler back uh, when God does something in your life. Might make the preacher better tonight. And uh, John chapter 4, verse 46. And I really believe the people with gray hair are going to outshout the people with, with brown hair tonight. And John chapter 4, verse 46, his word. It says this, once more he visited Canaan in Galilee, where he turned the water into wine. And there was a certain royal official there whose son lay sick in Capernaum. I'm in John chapter 4, verse number 47. When the man heard that Jesus had arrived in Galilee, from Judea, he went to him and begged him to come and heal his son, who was close to death. So this man has a child that is sick. Anybody ever had a child that was sick or, or kind of that moment? This man has a child that's sick. He's not a, he's not a Christian. He's not a believer. He's just a dignitary in the city. He's an official, a royal official of Rome in the city, so not even a part of the Jewish culture, the Jewish people. In fact, he's just overhearing about this one named Jesus that does what none, no one in Rome can do. And, and, and when he heard about Jesus, it drove him to a place he wouldn't normally go to receive something that he knew that only Jesus could give. And so I just want to just kind of put an exclamation point on that because people that are lost out there won't come here for fun, right? Most of my life I was trying to make church fun (laughs) for youth and fun. And and God spoke to me, said people that are lost don't come to church for fun. If people that are in the world want fun, they have a lot of places they already go that to them is very fun. They're not going to the church, they're going to the strip club, they're, they're going to the mall, they're going to uh, the, the, the casino, they're going, they're going somewhere like that to the club for fun. But if they come to church, they're coming for fulfillment of a promise that they need in their life. And so this royal official shows up to Jesus, all we gotta do is get Jesus in the house, and Jesus will do what Jesus does best, So we need his presence because his presence will draw the city. And so this man comes, and he comes because his son is sick. And he's heard that Jesus, how we know he doesn't know Jesus? Because he he calls him sir, not Lord. He calls him sir, not master. He has respect for him. He thinks he's a good man, but he doesn't know he's God and fully man. He's fully God, the God that formed the universe, and so he's about to find out. Amen? Amen. The royal official said, sir, come down here, verse 49, before my child dies. In verse 50, Jesus replied, you may go, your son will live, your son will live. The man took Jesus, how did he take Jesus? He took at him at his word. All you got to do is take Jesus at his word and everything's going to be okay tonight. The man took Jesus at his word and he departed. While he was still on his way, his servant met him with the news that his boy was living. Then he inquired of them the hour at which he got better. And they said to him, yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. Yesterday at the seventh hour, the fever left him. That's New King James Version. I was reading NIV until we got to that part because I accidentally left the NIV in there, another sermon that I did, and it says the fever left him yesterday at one o'clock. And one o'clock, the hour of one o'clock doesn't sound as cool as the seventh hour. But if I were to read King James Version the whole time, we would all be confused. Amen. Praise God. We thank you, Lord, for the these and thous. Then he inquired to them the hour which he got better, and they said, yesterday at the, come on, say it with me, at the 
hour, the fever left him. I declare over this church, the seventh hour. I declare over your family, the seventh hour. I declare a seventh hour anointing over your marriage, over your health, over your finances, over your mental health, over your physical health, over your ministry. Come on, I don't know who's going to receive this tonight. I declare the seventh hour. The fever left him yesterday at the seventh hour. Then the father realized this was the exact hour at which Jesus had said to him, your son will live. The exact hour. Then he and all his household believed. This was the second miraculous sign Jesus performed having come from Judea to Galilee. What, what was the first miraculous sign? It was at the beginning of the scripture. Do you remember that? The what? Y'all are listening. The water into wine. Why did he say that? There were so many miracles that happened in this city, in this place. And the one he kind of antidotes is this is the same place where I turned water. And it was the second of the two. And I, I believe that this is the same miracle just done in a different light. The water into wine. The man transformed. I believe that God is calling us to a seventh hour in this revival nights. I believe that you've been waiting a long time for the seventh hour to strike in your life. Some 15 years 20 years, 30 years, many of us have been in the sixth hour and the 59th minute. But when God decides to move the hand of the clock, there is no one that can stop it and no one that can get it going. When God decides, things shift. I'm declaring the seventh hour over your life. When it's the seventh hour, why would we care if it's the seventh hour? Because when it's the seventh hour, my son was talking to me the other day. He said, dad, I want to see the God of this Bible be the God of my life. I said, what do you mean, son? He's 11 years old. He said, I want to see the miracles like happen in there to happen in my life. Like when God stopped the sun, when God took down giants, when God raised the dead, I want to see him do that in my life. And I said, son, I declare the seventh hour over your life. Because when it's the seventh hour or the God hour or the God timing, it's when walls come down. It's when giants fall. It's when seas split. It's when barren give birth. It's when murderers become preachers. It's when devils run and cancer hides and anxiety comes to an end and racism is silenced and fear runs from every exit. I believe God is sending a seventh hour to those It's when teenagers won't bow to the things that are set up. When everybody else bows, it's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said it's the seventh hour. And we will not bow. And even if you try to kill us, we still won't bow. And those three teenagers worshiped in the fire. But I can tell you again today that God always shows up in the seventh hour. Because even in the fire, there was a fourth man in that fire. And those three teenagers didn't even smell like smoke. God just allowed the fire to burn off what they put on them. And after that moment, they were propelled to the highest place in the land. I'm believing for a seventh hour. I'm I'm just prophesying. I'm just prophesying right now. Mark this day in the calendar. Mark this moment in this conference in the calendar. Things you've been waiting on. Things that seem delayed in God's mailbox. I believe now things are breaking. Things are shifting in the atmosphere. And this man comes to Jesus, he comes to Jesus in his 6th hour and 59th minute. I don't know if you've ever been in your 6th hour and 59th minute. I don't know if you've ever been waiting on God with a problem that felt really large. And he moves from where he's at to where God's calling him to be. 
Sometimes our problems can seem overwhelming, can seem almost bigger than God, but the first step to seeing your problems in the real light that they are is to move closer to God. The first thing this man does, he doesn't even know God, but he knows enough to move closer to God with his big problem. I was riding with my son the other day. My son always gives me great sermons. He's always asking me questions. <laughs> Most of his questions I can't answer yet, and I went to Bible college, so good luck, dads. You know, I'm just asking for the Holy Spirit's guidance. And he said, Dad, if the sun is so big, why can I squish it? So I just was like, Lord, help me. I'm on my way to preach. And there was an air freshener in our car. And I have a picture of that air freshener. And we were driving. And I said, see how the air freshener in our car is bigger in my picture than the car outside. I said, the reason why it's bigger than the car is not because it's actually bigger than the car. Because how could this air freshener be bigger than the car and it's inside our car? You say, that's right, Dad. That's like a riddle. I don't don't know. And I said, it's not bigger than the car outside our car. It's bigger in our perspective than the car outside the car because we're closer to the air freshener than we are to the car. I said, the reason why you can squish the sun is the sun is far away. And then I pulled up a picture of the earth in comparison to the sun. I brought a picture of that as well. And I showed him this. And I said, I know that the sun is little in your perspective, but your perspective is off because you're closer to the earth than you are to the sun. The reason why your problem is so big and your God is so small is because you've grown closer to your problem than you have to your God. And if you get get anything from tonight, I'm calling you to move. I'm calling you to shift from where you're at Because as long as you stay where you're at, you'll do the devil's praise party, which is called worry. Worry is the worship of hell. Worship is the worship of heaven. So many times, my problem felt so big, and it's real problems. I remember my kid being sick, my daughter being sick. When she was younger, my my 12-year-old daughter, when she was about three years old, she began to have febrile seizures. And every time she would get a fever, which is often for kids she would have a seizure, and the seizure would cause her to stop breathing. And so the first time it happened, it freaked us out. The second time it happened, it freaked us out. The third time it happened, I felt so lost for words. I remember it being three in the morning, and no one's awake. My wife's calling 911. I'm holding her. She's black and blue. I'm shaking her and begging God, please, God. Heal my daughter, please, God. I remember waiting for what I thought was the Calvary, which was the ambulance, but they just took too long getting there. And I knew that in that moment, there was only one. I'm thankful for doctors. I'm thankful for our workers. But there are some moments in life where there is only one that can answer the problem. I remember crying out in the middle of my driveway when my neighbors couldn't help me and my mom and dad weren't awake and our prayer team couldn't be rallied. It was me and God out there. This man had a problem that that no one could solve but Jesus. Sometimes God will allow those kind of problems so we can go to the right source. And this man shows up to Jesus. And the first thing that Pastor Jesus says when this man acts for a miracle is he said, you people. Can you imagine Pastor Whalen? he's up here and you come up and you're a different culture than Pastor Whalen. And he said, Pastor, I just can you pray for my kid? Pastor Whalen, of course, right? But Pastor Jesus, a different culture than this guy, says to him, you people. Whoa, <laughs> Pastor Jesus. Don't say things like that. What was Jesus doing? Jesus was checking his heart for stones. He was seeing if the man would get offended by his words. 
Because he was about to plant his word in the man's heart. And seeds can't grow with weeds and rocks. And so the man is not offendable easy. He says, sir, come down here before my child dies. <laughs> I don't care what you're going to call me. I need a miracle from you. And then Jesus says to the man, your son will live. And so the Bible says that this man begins a journey with simply the word. He has the word hidden in his heart. He has a word from Jesus. I don't know anybody here that has a word from the Lord. I, I don't know who I came to talk to who, who God spoke to you about something, maybe even 10 years ago, maybe even five, maybe even five days ago, he spoke to you a word that you knew that you knew that it came from his mouth and not somebody else. And that word was planted in the soil of your heart. The people in this room, we are simply carriers of his word carriers of his seeds and this man took the word of God and he it, it sent him on a journey he didn't ask God for five more visions or ten more dreams or three more signs he had enough he had a word a rhema word from God that was like God himself highlighted this word and it's mine and he took this word and the Bible says he went on a journey now, this journey that he went with was a 25-mile journey. On this journey, there would have been hills and valleys and ravines, and, and, and this journey was too long at this time with the treacherous terrain to get there in a day, to get there in an hour, to get 25 miles in his day with the things he had to carry and, and, and being a dignitary, there were, there were people that would have been after him to, to kill him. And, and so he's going to have to go through the hood. He's going to have to go through different areas. He's going to have to go through by, you know, places where he could get killed or, or, or robbed. Or, but but it, the journey is worth it. And so the man takes the journey with the word of God. But if you've taken a long journey, even though God spoke it, there are some times in the journey that you're not where you were, and you're not where you want to be, but you're somewhere in the middle, some, somewhere, oh, you heard a word from God, you received a word from God, you have not felt it or touched it or saw it fulfilled yet, it's that he said it. And so I believe it, so I'm going. And the Bible says while the man was still on his way, meaning that he was on this journey for a while. In fact, this man would have had to set up camp on the in-between. He would have had to set up a tent and a shelter right in the middle of the journey. He would have had to build a shelter not where he wanted to be and not where God spoke to him, he would have to be in isolation all by himself, remembering the, the frequencies of Jesus' voice, but not yet seeing the fulfillment of Jesus' voice. I don't know who I came to talk to tonight, but I wonder if possibly, maybe I came to talk to a few people that are exactly like this man, standing on the in-between, camping on the in-between. Some of us have been on the in-between so long, we turned the tent into our house. We, we turned a temporary situation into, in our minds, what has become now permanent. And maybe God forgot. Maybe God messed up. And so often on the in-between, it's me looking for another voice to give me another word just to encourage me from the first word I got. I'm looking for anybody just to encourage me. Because it's in that moment that, that the enemy does his best work. It's in the middle of the night, right, where things in the light look great, but you get in the night out here in these, these, these desert parts, you know, you'll be hearing things that you never thought you'd hear, and it's just a squirrel or something, but you thought it was a mountain lion. You, there, are, there are things in the day that when they make noise in the night, even if they're small in the day, at night they grow. 
And the enemy does his best work, at least in my life, he's done his best work in the night. He'll come around the shelter I've set up and the journey of God's call as a pastor, as a leader, as a father. God has given me words over my church, words over my city, words over my household. And it's often in the middle of the night that the enemy will come and he'll whisper. He'll, he'll whisper with his ugly voice, his ugly face through the tent. He'll say things like, God didn't really say, did he? He's been doing it since the beginning. That's what he did to Eve. Are you sure God really said? I mean, maybe, yeah, he said, but not all that because you don't see it yet. So because you don't see it, maybe God didn't say it. And I found that the devil does not rule from a throne because with the cross of Calvary, Jesus took his throne. He took his authority. He took his keys and gave them to us. So he doesn't rule from a throne. He often rules through a throne. God has given us authority. He's given us the keys to the gate. He says, whatever you loose on earth, you loose in heaven. Whatever you bind on earth, you bind in heaven. In other words, I got your back. So the enemy wants his keys back, but he can't have them. So what he tries to do is he tries to speak lies into my ear to get me to say it out of my mouth. Because when you speak it, things shift, things change, because words are seeds. And when you speak the devil's words, you grow different fruit than when you speak God's words. How do I know it's the devil's word? Because it's contrary to God's word. It sounds like worry, not like worship. Who's ever gotten caught in speaking worry? Speaking negative. Speak, and God says, look, if, if it's not, he says, look, if, if, if it sounds like this, whatever's lovely, whatever's true, whatever's noble, is just speak these things. Anything else in your mind, go ahead and take it captive, grab it, wrestle it down, and m- submit it to my authority. Why? Because you have power. Did you know that's why demons want to possess people? Because demons don't have mouths? They want your mouth. They want your words. They want your speech. They want your worship. But in the in-between, God has set a group of people that has said, you know what? Even on the in-between, I will praise him. On the in-between, I will lift him up. On the in-between, I will magnify him. On the in-between, I'll glorify. That's what you're here doing Monday night. You're here on Monday night lifting up a praise. See, the person next to you doesn't even know what kind of in-between you're on. The person next to you thought you were just a worshiper by default. You just said that was easy for you to lift up a praise and shout a little bit. But some of us are dealing with some real issues right now. We are in a battle right now. But our worship is enthroning a different spirit. Our worship is enthroning the spirit of the Lord in the middle of this prison cell. See, God knows he's giving you pictures. He's giving, oh, it's up here. He's giving you pictures. See, every, every seed starts out as a picture. You know, some of you are single, ready to mingle with someone that's the right person. And Lord, would you send them? And God says, I'm going to give you pumpkin. There she is. <laughs> I'm looking for pumpkin. Hey, there's some men out. Come on, we got any single men out here looking for pumpkin. Come on, let me see you. Let me see you. I'm looking for pumpkin. God has promised me pumpkin. Or maybe it's marigold. Maybe he's promised you marigold. Or, or maybe sweet basil is who you're looking for. Amen. <laughs> right? It gives you a picture. It gives you a picture of your marriage being healthy. It gives you a picture of your, your business growing. It gives you a picture of you being the head and not the tail. He, he gives you a picture. And then the problem is he sends you on a journey. And usually the journey is to the soil. Now, I don't know if you can see in my soil, I got some manure. I got some fertilizer. Don't get too close, it smells. I don't know why God would choose this dark, dirty place to put his most preciable vision. I don't know why God would choose 
to put pumpkin, marigold, and sweet basil. I don't know why God would choose to use me in this ministry. I don't know why God would choose me to be the head and not the tail. And so we get this life and we're confused and God goes, the best place to unlock the seed is in the manure. I didn't choose you because you were perfect. I chose you because you had the right fertilizer. Life gave you the right stuff. And he said, but before we can really plant my word, we got to pull out the weeds. We got to forgive some people. We got to let go of some dead dreams, some things that weren't me, but you kept holding on to them and they just brought death to the, to the garden. We got to pull out the past things. We got to pull out the rocks. Uh, we got a lot of rocks in here. This is the rock Joan, Joan and Julie right here and, and, and Mark. And, and this is that past failure. And this is that other person that hurts you. We, we got to make some room. We got to make some, somebody say, I'm making some room. I'm making some room. I'm making some room. I know you see fertilizer, but I see God's chosen vehicle to bring about fruit in my life. And so this man goes on a journey and God's removing. It's something about the in-between that will remove the rocks. There's something about the in-between that will help you remove the weeds. And God says, okay, open up that vision I've given you. It's crazy when you open up the vision that God's given you and it's so bright and colorful and big and then you pull out what it really looks like now. And you're like, God, I thought you said this. What in the world is this? I mean, no one's going to believe me. No one's going to believe. I got fur, I got manure and I got this. And this is Marigold? And God says, I do my best work in the soil. You're going to have to get some tools out. You're going to have to dig deep. You're going to have to do some work. You're going to have to do some work on the end. God spoke it, but that's not the end. That's the beginning. When God speaks it, see, God doesn't give gifts that you don't have to steward. God gives gifts like children are a gift from the Lord. If you have a kid and you don't steward that kid, it's not going to feel like a gift. It's going to feel like a curse. (laughs) I'll say it for you. The gifts God gives have to be stewarded. His word has to be stewarded. God says if you just hear this thing and do nothing, You're fooling yourself. Your religion is worthless. You have to steward this word. You have to plant it deep in the soil. You have to water this word. People are coming by. They're going, what are you doing? Why would you waste such precious water on manure? Well, you don't know what God put inside this manure. You don't know the seeds. He's been, I know, I know it doesn't look like much. I know I look crazy. You might have to look crazy for a season watering dirt. See, some of you keep watering your marriage. You keep watering it. You say, God, I, I'm just going to trust you. I'm going to tithe when you call me to tithe. I'm going to be generous even though I haven't seen it in my business. I'm going to bless someone else's business. I'm going to pray for someone else while I'm sick. I'm going to show up again. I'm going to believe again. Come on, there may be days and months he has you watering manure. And people come by and say, what is that church thing you're doing on Monday night? Why would you ever go to church on Monday night? Why don't you do something that matters? Why don't you, why don't you go to a TED Talk or something like that? Or watch a YouTube video. Why are you going to that place? Why would you risk everything to believe for that? This is just manure. And you say, no, no, God has given me a vision. He's given me, look, vision gives purpose to pain. Vision gives purpose to pain. And if you are going to birth what God has called you to birth, can I, can I got any women in the house that have given birth? If, you, if you're going to birth what God's called you to birth, you are going to go through. See, me and, my, me and my wife, we were pregnant. Three times we were pregnant. First time, we were pregnant, man. We were celebrating together. We were shooting off fireworks together, blue fireworks, pink fireworks. Everybody was giving us gifts. They were trying to come rub my tummy. You know, we were, we were pregnant together. She was hungry for things. I was hungry for things. She was going through pain. I was going through 
I thought was pain. (laughs) She couldn't sleep at night. I couldn't sleep at night. Until the baby showed up. And there was a moment in that hospital room where I realized that we were no longer pregnant. (laughs) She was pregnant. And I was just there for moral support and to receive whatever she was going to call me (laughs) and smile and say, thank you, baby. Keep pushing, baby. Keep going. You're a beautiful baby. Come on. We got a child coming. You're giving birth. I'm just here to support. There is a time when the pain shows up that you realize that no one else can carry the vision of God for you, that there may be supporters around you. But when the pain shows up, it reminds you that you are the one that is birthing this thing. Pain can only be conquered through vision. When you know what God is speaking to you. And the Bible says that the man kept moving on his word. He was still moving on his word. I came to just let you know tonight. I know at the beginning of your journey, you were sprinting, but maybe that sprint turned into a jog, and maybe that jog turned into a a slower jog, and maybe that jog turned into a walk, and maybe that walk turned into a crawl, and maybe that crawl turned into a scoot. See, there are people here that, that people look at you scooting, and they think you've been moving slow the whole time, but it's just the process of the journey. The journey God called you to is bigger than the journey maybe he called other people to. And just the fact that you are still moving forward on his word is enough, is enough. I want to tell you today, the devil is a liar. My Bible says when you've done everything to stand, stand there for. Sometimes it's a victory just to still be here. Still still be praising. Still be on the front row taking notes. This isn't the perfect section. These are the people that said, I'm still here. I'm still going for it. I'm still giving God all that I have. Look what it says in Isaiah 55, 8. It says, "I, I, I, I don't think the way you think. The way you work isn't the way I work, God decrees. For as the sky soars high above the earth, and so I will work, so, pa- uh, so the way I work surpasses the way you work, and the way I think beyond the way you think. Just as rain and snow descend from the skies and don't go back until they've watered the earth, doing their work of making things grow and blossom, producing seeds for farmers and food for the hungry so will the words that come out of my mouth not come back empty handed they'll do the work I sent them to do they will complete the assignment I gave them God promises you on the in between if you got his word he's letting you know I don't work like you work I don't think like you think and I don't have eyes like you have I am at a higher elevation I see things different than you see. I never forget the times where I was on an airplane and we're in a storm and everything's shaking and everything's going crazy. And there's this moment where we broke through the storm and the sun's out and the birds are flying. And God says, this is what my vision is like. I see things just at a different elevation. And so what I've spoken to you will come to pass. The man was still on his way. While he was still on his way, the Bible says a servant showed up. He said, what are you here to do tonight? I'm I'm not here to be a preacher tonight. I'm just his servant. And I came from the other side of what you're believing for. And I came to let you know as his servant 
I know you're beat up. I know you're tired. I know you're weary. I know you almost got taken out on that last three miles. I know you almost stayed camping in the in-between. But I came as a servant of the Lord tonight to declare the seventh hour over your life. I came from the other side of what you've been believing for with the word of God. I'm armed with his word tonight. But I came to tell you what you're believing for is already done. It's already finished. It's already complete. I'm sure in that moment, the man got a new pep in his step. He got a new passion inside his being. He's, all, he's awake. He's alive. He, he's, yes, sir, I've talked to him. He can't wait to see you. I'm sure what was a, a crawl or a scoot changed to a full-on sprint. And the Bible says as he's, he's sprinting with him on the way back home, he pauses and he says, wait, I got to know. I got to know when it happened. Come on, you got to tell me. I, I, this has been such a journey. This has been such a season. I, I just got to know when, when his word shifted to reality. He says, ah, maybe it was the third hour. Oh, that third hour? It was three hours into the journey. And on that third hour, Man, that was a mountain I climbed. On that third hour, kicking and screaming and crying and tears, I climbed up that mountain. Oh, but maybe it was a fourth hour. Because the fourth hour, I was on the top, and I sang a new song unto the Lord, and I danced before God because I felt his word. Oh, no, it wasn't the fourth hour. Maybe it was the fifth hour. Fifth, I started coming down. I was cruising, but, but I almost quit, but I didn't. I tripped on the way down, but I got back up. I bandaged my wound, and I kept going. Oh, no, not the fifth hour. Maybe it was the sixth hour. The hour of man. What I did, what I said, what I prayed. I, re I fasted that sixth hour because I was eating the time before, and I just felt like, man, I need to, I need to really water this seed. And I fasted in, in that, that sixth hour. It wasn't the sixth hour? No, sir, uh, none of those. It was the seventh hour. Seventh hour. Sixth hour. Seventh, seventh hour. Seventh, seventh. It couldn't have been. It couldn't have been the seventh hour. That was the exact hour I was with Jesus. Wait a second. Seventh hour is when he said it. Sir, that was the hour. At the seventh hour. Out of nowhere, your son got up. He started breathing and rejoicing and the whole house erupted. I will never forget the seventh hour. There's no way it could have been the seventh hour because the seventh hour is exactly when Jesus said it. You mean I didn't do anything to earn the miracle? You mean it wasn't the pain of my journey? It was the power of his word? You mean it wasn't how long I attended, how many times I prayed, how good I was? He was good to his word, even when I wasn't good to his word? You mean I didn't earn it with my good days and didn't disearn it with my bad days? You mean he was good? It happened the moment he said it? The moment he says the word. Why? Because God is not working on the miracle. The miracle is done. God is working on the man. The journey, the journey you've been on is not to change the miracle. Is not to make the miracle. God already made the miracle. The same God who spoke planets into existence, not 10 days, not 20 days, not for the moment he speaks, things happen. No bulldozers, no blueprints, no work crew, instantly. So the journey is not making the miracle. Your miracle is done. The journey is making the man. The journey. How do I know that? 
Because either Jesus misspoke or he was talking about a different son that would be healed. He said, your son will be healed. Why didn't he say your son is healed? He said will be because he wasn't talking about that son. He was talking about the man. This journey was going to heal the man. Because when he gets to the home, it's not the son who preaches to the town. It's the man. The whole household believed, not just because of the miracle, but because of what God was doing in the man. He was putting the man into the fire. God does his best work in the fire. As the band comes, it's the fire of testing. Job said it this way. Job said about the fire, verse 23, 8, but if I go to the east, he's not there. If I go to the west, I do not find him. When he is at work in the north, I don't see him. When he returns to the south, I catch no glimpse of him. Verse 10, but, but what? He knows the way I take. And when he has tested me, I will come forth as gold. God is purifying the gold in the journey. God has given you value in the journey. Did you know I, I went to this crazy thing called chat GPT? I like just asking chat things. And I said, chat Tell me something about gold that you don't think I know. And chat told me lots of things about gold I didn't know because I feel like God's constantly got me in the fire producing gold in me. Chat told me that gold, according to all its resources, is not made here. It's not a metal that is really formed on this earth. That it's actually formed in the stars. And gold, you can go look it up because I know that's, you didn't know that either. I, I didn't know that. Gold is formed when two stars have a nuclear explosion. And when it cools down, it comes into comets and it lands all over the universe. There is gold in the galaxy. And the gold that's been shown up on our earth was from comets that hit our earth. Gold is rare. If they took all the gold we've ever found, it would fill up two Olympic-sized swimming pools. That's how rare this stardust, or we could say God's chemistry project, is on our earth. Yet the process of gold, you don't just find it on the ground lying there. To get gold, you have to dig into the sides of mountains. You have to labor to get to the gold. And once you get the gold, it goes through a process. It has to be broken to be refined. Before it's ever put in the fire, it has to be broken into smaller pieces over and over and over. There's crushing and there's breaking to the gold. God's put gold inside of you. And the digging and the crushing, he chose you out of the rest of the world. And he handpicked you because there was something of value in your life. And he crushed and it breaks. And then the gold goes through a process of refining. It goes through smelting by fire. Over and over again, the gold is constantly put into the hottest of temperatures where it even itself begins to melt. It changes the way it is. It, it, things shift and move. But in that process of melting, the other metals that are stuck in the gold begin to come to the surface. Did you know that? It doesn't fall out of the bottom of the gold. It comes to the surface. Isn't it when God has you in the fire, that anger comes up, that lust comes up, that frustration comes up? Many times in that moment, we're, we're mad. We're like, well, there I am again. God's like, no, I brought it to the surface to remove it. 
So God will pull the metal out, then he'll put it back in. Then he'll pull it out, then he'll put it back in. And the worker does this until he can see his face in the gold. God's putting you in, taking you out of the fire, allowing things. He pulls it out to remove, and he puts you back in. He pulls it out to remove, puts you back in over and over again. Because gold, once it's purified, is the most valuable metal in all of our earth. Why? Because gold does not tarnish. It does not corrode. And gold is the most malleable metal in all the earth. Why is God purifying us so he can form us into his image over and over and over again? God was not working the miracle. He was purifying the man so that when he held the miracle he would speak about the miracle worker not about his hands God has been purifying you in the fire I don't know who I came to talk to tonight that's been in the fire a little feels like almost too long but God has got you in the right amount of time because he's looking for his face in the gold you know what's crazy about gold is they say actually gold is found in human organisms. Did you know that in this room we all have gold inside of us? They found it in our blood. There is gold in your blood and in the strands of your hair. It's funny how my God says, even the, I've counted the number of hairs on your head. Some of us have more gold than others. Amen try to make up for it with a beard praise God God will take a beard got some gold there you know gold everywhere it's kind of interesting that the person next to you is a gold mine the person next to you has the strands of God all running through them they just have to go through the process we're all in a process together And God has dug us out of the mountains and pulled us into this place. And he's creating beautiful, ornate jewelry out of our lives. What an amazing God we serve. I can see people's, their tears are flowing tonight. It's okay if tears start coming down because tears water your seats. Watering dirt tonight. But there is fruit in the dirt because how many apples are in the apple seed? Unlimited. The fight is to destroy the seed that God has planted of his word. You're here tonight and you're going through the fire. God wants to remind you that not the devil that has you in the fire he's allowing the purification process to happen in your life because the word that he's planted in your heart and the word is already finished God's not working on the miracle he's working on the man stop worrying about the miracle and start focusing on the man God what do you want to teach me through this What are you trying to show me through this moment? Not why do you have me here? God, what are you going to do with this moment? This is crazy. How are you going to get the victory through this? Who's here in the fire tonight? Let me see if you're in the fire tonight. Would you stand to your feet? You're in the fire tonight. You're in the fire tonight. Come on, if you're in the fire, would you just lift both hands? Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, we thank you. Come on, if you're next to someone standing up and you're not in the fire, would you just put your hands towards them? We're just going to pray for anybody in the fire. I guess it's most everybody is in the fire tonight. (laughs) You're in the fire tonight. You're on the in-between tonight. You're, You're still here going on his work. And tonight, God has given you hope tonight. God has given you victory tonight. God is speaking to you from his word tonight. The Bible says to those that wait on the Lord will be renewed. And God, we thank you that in the fire, you can shape us. 
you can mold us. God, we pray, God, that everything you're melting out of us, everything that's rising to the surface, God, we just ask, Lord, that you would purify us in the fire. You would, you would, you would pull out that value that's in our lives, God, that can only be seen in the fire. God, we thank you, God, that you do not leave us in the fire. You do not leave us in the fire, God. You are the fourth man in the fire. You carry us in the fire. You lift us up in the fire. You encourage us in the fire. Come on, if you're in the fire tonight, would you just make your way down to this front, down to this altar? You've worried long enough. You've walked long enough. You've crawled long enough. God wants you to move forward. God wants you to move forward. He says, trust me tonight. Trust me tonight. Trust me in the fire. I trust you in the fire. Come on, maybe you're in the fire that looks like sickness. Maybe you're in the fire that that looks like loss. Maybe you're in the fire that, that feels like abandonment. Maybe, I don't know what fire you're in. A financial fire. A fire of worry about our government and worry about what's happening in the world right now. Lord, we just pray right now, Holy Spirit, over these mighty warriors, we pray right now, Holy Spirit, as they move forward, as they say, God, we trust your word. Come on, would you lift your hands and say, God, tonight I trust your hand. Do in the fire what only you can do. God, tonight, let my worship water the seed that's in my life that you planted. And tonight, God, I declare the seventh hour, meaning, God, when you spoke it, it was finished. When you said it, it was done. And I believe it, and I receive it, and I declare it. Tonight, God, the miracle is already finished. Now work your miracle in me. Renew my mind. Renew my heart. Give me hope. Restore my dreams. Awaken that warrior spirit inside of me. In Jesus' name. Come on, if you believe that, why don't you begin to praise Him? Why don't you get to worship Him? We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We worship you, Lord. We lift you up, Lord. Hallelujah. Come on, can we sing this?